Hey guys, welcome back to Next Week with Jeff Durbin. Very excited about tonight's episode. Make sure you guys go to apologiastudios.com to get more. A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A studios.com. You guys can partner with us there as a ministry. You get all kinds of radio shows, television shows, all that stuff is there. Also go to endabortionnow.com. You can sign up with your local church, get free training, get free resources. Everything is completely for free where you can join the almost 500 local churches who are out saving lives at their local abortion mills. Again, very excited about tonight's episode. Some of you guys remember we've talked before about the riot and the dance. It is an amazing film. If you haven't seen it after the show, go get it right away. But we have N.D. Wilson with us on today. He is behind the film with uh, Gordon Wilson. It is The Riot and the Dance Part 2. It's The Riot and the Dance Water. And it is incredible, and you have to see it. And so I'm going to introduce you. If you aren't familiar with N.D. Wilson, N.D. Wilson is the author of the Hundred Cupboards series. Uh, there's a book that you just must have. I say all the time, sell your shirt and shoes and make sure you buy it. It's called Death by Living by N.D. Wilson. It will bless you in a big, big way. He's also the author of the famous Hello Ninja. Uh, some of you guys know what that is. It's an, a, it's a, it's an amazing book. Uh, uh, a bunch of work behind him and an amazing bunch of work, I hope, ahead of him. The Ride of the Dance, again, part one was amazing. Now we're here to talk about the Ride of the Dance, part two. Please welcome special guest N.D. Wilson. Thank you. So glad to be here. Absolutely. All right, brother. So let's talk the Ride of the Dance, uh, part one. We talked about before. We advertised before. We promoted before. It was amazing. It was wonderful. I got to be with you at Sabbath dinner to talk about what you were doing, in production at least, for uh, part two of The Ride of the Dance, and that is Water. So talk to us about what this film is all about. Well, we wanted to continue our exploration and celebration of God's creation, and the next natural step was to go from above ground, land animals, into that other world. Most of God's creatures, a huge number of God's creatures at least, live in an entirely different ecosystem. They live in an entirely different world than we do. We move around in this air, which, of course, I kind of think of as thin water, but they live in this submerged place, dark, cold, totally different. And one of the, thing that's, the things that's really amazing to me when you actually put on the mask and you put on the scuba gear and you go is you discover animals that have been living and dying and just living stories and living beautiful stories and these amazing creatures that for millennia, only God has seen. No one has seen them but God. Only he knows them. And every dark, barren corner we get to, places we think are totally lifeless, we go and we find creatures. We find creatures designed beautifully, designed fearfully, designed awesomely, and creatures that are funny, that are scary, that are beautiful. And we find all these things that God has been filling his entire world with uh, out of his sheer pleasure just for joy, just for the beauty of it. And so we, we wanted to go take note and go celebrate with him. Now that we actually have the ability to take a camera down, to actually see these creatures and to see them for what they are, which is his handiwork, we wanted to make sure we did it. We actually, we dove in and we went and showed kids all around the world the kind of things that God does. That's amazing, brother. And that's uh, what I appreciate so much about what you guys are doing is you're doing it well. It's beautifully done. It's um it's professionally done. It's it's very very well done as a film. At least I've seen part one already. Of course, it was wonderful. But I love part what you guys. Part two is better. Part two is better. It's part two. Yeah, I know. We were talking about that. Part two is better. Um, I I I I think everyone needs to hear from you about uh, the perspective and the goal of this that makes it distinct from say another history or sorry Nature Channel documentary those sorts of things because we have lots of. Uh, of, of films now that have gone underwater, looked at these creatures, yeah. or that, you know, that are, they're in the thin water and they're showing us all these amazing yeah. creatures. But you're approaching this from a completely different perspective than is the, many of these popular nature documentaries and films would be. So, so talk about that, your perspective on these creatures and what you're doing, and also what's the goal? What are you guys trying to do with this? Perspective first and then goal. And so really think of it this way. Imagine if Christians collectively decided that we should let unbelievers handle all of our Bible translation. Mm. All of it. Like, you know what? We're just going to give God's word to them and let them interpret it. And that's it. And that's exactly what we've done with God's natural revelation. 
So we have a special revelation, and we would we would never want to do that. We would never say we'd never say let's give this to the atheist societies to translate, and we're just going to let them do it. And so they'll they'll show us you know whatever they come up with. But when we go to God's natural revelation, His other words, all these other words made flesh, all these little incarnations, these creations of His, where He spoke and they came into being, mm. we just give them to God haters to interpret. We just give them the God haters to study, to marvel at, or to just sit there and point a camera at them and then talk about how meaningless it all is. Now this all just came out of chaos. There's no meaning in any of this. And so it's this huge abdication in the church over the last few centuries as we've just walked away from the natural world. We've walked away from God's natural revelation. Now we've also walked away from his special revelation, so that's no real surprise. Right. But a massive section of the church is still like still really reveres God's word. They study the Bible. We all agree we should be in the word and we want to read it. But then we move to all of God's other words, to his creativity. We move to those places where he celebrates his own creativity and he glorifies himself and his creatures. Yeah. And we say, hey, let's let the God haters come do this part. Mm. All the people who hate him, you guys run this. And so they make those documentaries, and while they see beautiful things, and they see beautiful creatures, then they can show them to us, and I'm really grateful for it. They put their own narration over the top of it. And they, they're anti-God, fundamentally anti-God, and anti-man. Yeah. They, hate, they hate us, too. They hate us in the creation. They hate that we're there. They hate that we change things. They hate that we affect it. They completely ignore the relationship that man's supposed to have to creation, you know, stewardship and dominion, you know, that's repulsive to them. So they're anti-man, and then much worse, they're anti-God. So that's the perspective. The perspective of these documentaries is a celebration of the creator through the creatures. We look at the creatures, and they tell us how to celebrate the creator. They tell us about God. So if you really want to know your father, you want to know your father well, but you don't want to walk through the mu museum of all of his artwork, that's, that's bizarre. Yeah. Like, yeah, he's my father, and he made a cabillion beautiful things. I'm just going to hang out over here. Yeah. I'm not even going to look. I'm not going to pay any mind. I'm not going to pay any attention. And when I do look, I'm going to make sure I have a, a, somebody who hates my father explain it all to me. <laughs> that's <Yeah. laughs> that's doesn't powerful. make any sense. So the perspective is a celebration of God through his words, his living words out there in the world. And a celebration of man's role in that creation. Yes. Um, and just, we just assume that as we go out and do this. We make sure that Gordon, uh, who's the actual host, is on screen with animals, that he's touching animals, that he's engaging with them. We're not distant and cold and mechanical. We get down in there personally. But then also the effect I want to have is I want to edify families. I want to edify kids. I want kids who look out their, to look out their windows and look out their back doors and see the glory of God mm. and see the glory of their Father all over it. I don't want them to look out and say, it's all chaotic. It all looks meaningless. It can be pretty, but it doesn't mean anything. Like, no, it means something. There's a fundamental meaning everywhere in all of us. Then a lot of it, it means is that your dad, your Father in Heaven, is a lot of fun and is crazy creative. And he gave all this to all of us. He laughs. He's joyful. You know, he has so much pleasure in these creatures, and we should find the same pleasure uh, in getting to know them and getting to know him through them. The last thing I wanted to do is I wanted to wake us up to little things like water. We just take it for granted. We don't even think about why God did this or why did God choose water for baptism. And there's this amazing relationship that we have with water. And water is very much life, and it, we need it to live, and it's everywhere. It sustains life. But it's also death. Water destroys. Water, water ravages. Too much kills us. It smashes cities. It tears down mountains. Water, in, I think in its most essential form, water pictures baptism perfectly. Baptism is death, and baptism is life. Mm. It, is both, it is both things. Like, it does both. And when you, when you really get out there in the elements and you say, wow, it's so weird that it's, it's death and life, both. Everywhere we go, we see death. And everywhere we go, we see life in water. And that's, 
it's really striking to suddenly be like, oh, wow, well, of course we do. That's it's water. Right. You know, and, and the whole world's been baptized one time, and we were told in the New Testament that it was, it's baptism. You know, the flood was baptism. Uh, and we just think, oh, symbolisms. God didn't really bake it, bake it all the way down into the actual substance, but he really did. I yeah. mean, the rivers are flowing, and they're flowing full of decay and all this death. And they're flowing full of life at the same time. Yes. That's powerful. Man, Nate, that's good stuff, brother. Um, so just, just for fun, you, I know when we, sat, when we had dinner together, we talked a bit about this, but you stepped into the ocean. And, went, I mean, for me, I'd be like, uh, maybe I'll stay on the boat today where you guys do your thing. And I'll just, I'll just celebrate God's creation by watching the situation. Uh, but you went into the ocean and went under there, and you were—you probably got to see some crazy creatures and some terrifying creatures. What was the experience? Yeah. What was the experience like for you? Uh, how, how was it transforming to you to go under the water like that and to come into this whole other world? Which, I mean, you said it, Nate. What I think is is powerful. There was there was a long period of time where these things were just shouting all these amazing things to God and to only, hit, he's only seeing them. It's like yeah. there, there's these, this vast universe out there where there are, there are planets out there and stars and amazing spiraling galaxies that nobody's ever seen except God. And they're only, it, it's just for him. It's, it's just his, yep. for his glory. But now you got to step into it. And so I imagine some of it was terrifying. It would be for me. Some of it must have been exhilarating. And so just uh, talk to us about, like, how did it impact you? What happened while you were under there? So there's a, a couple of things. One is when, when we go through stuff that we captured, there's, there's times when we realize just fundamentally this is not about us. It's not about us because these wolf fields have been married for 25 years in a hole in the rock, you know, a couple hundred feet down in the dark. Just, uh, you know, they, they mate for life. They're down there. They're hilarious. They're, they're awesome. And you look at this and exactly what you just said. You think, we didn't even know about these things for millennia. So what is it about, man? Like, this isn't about us. These guys, these, these fish exist for God. Yeah. They exist for God's pleasure. That's why they're here. That's why we're here. So it's really humbling in that sense. Like you go places and it's not about you. It just isn't. But it's not about it's not about man at all when you get down there. Uh, but so it's fun and it's humbling and it's it really brings a, a profound humility when you meet these creatures that only he's known forever. Yeah. Uh, but it also brings a profound humility when you really look at some of them, whales, for example, sharks. You look at them and you think, man, we're so, we're so frail, we're so feeble. They're like, this, this whale's the size of three school buses, and it's just cruising along, singing, all the way from Hawaii to Alaska. <laughs> yeah, these, these, these male whales are singing songs on a loop, like a road trip, from Hawaii to Alaska, and they don't stop. That's crazy. And, and it's the same song. And again, only God and some other annoyed whales here. Yeah. You know, and I don't know if they're singing 99 bottles of beer on the wall or what they're doing, but... <laughs> Road, road but, trip. You know, they're singing, and it's it's really humbling to see all the stuff that's been going on without us. Yeah. But also, I would say I came to the, a far more profound understanding of Genesis nine. Uh, get the dread of man on animals. Getting getting into water with sharks. So when we got into water with sharks, I experienced adrenaline levels I'd never experienced before. I imagine. Yep. I experienced adrenaline levels that peaked and then stayed peaked. <laughs> <You> know, just <laughs> hours, like just hours of, of adrenaline peaking. So when we got off a boat miles offshore in sharky waters with no cage, and, and they, they told us, the guides told us, if you make aggressive eye contact, they won't attack you. And... They'll try to sneak up on you. They'll come up at your legs. They'll come from behind. So make sure you stay on a swivel. You're looking all directions constantly. But when you when you catch them sneaking up on you and you you see them and they're coming at you like a torpedo, lean at them and look them in the eye, and they'll flinch away. And that was bizarre. Yeah. And it, it is in fact true. So I spent about three hours in one of these shoots, 
just in shark-infested waters being circled by 30 sharks. These are not small sharks. Most of them are bigger than I am. And they respond to eye contact. And I'm, you know, pasty and flailing in their water, and none of them are biting me, none of them are attacking me. They're sneaking up, they're bumping into our cameras. I kick one, you know, they're, they're coming up close to us. But they're not attacking. Any one of them could kill me by themselves, let alone 30 of them. Yeah. And yet they look at me in the eye and they, they retreat. And the, when I was talking to actual, the, the shark experts who are going at it from a secular perspective, they said, well, they think you're a bigger, more dominant shark. Like, no, they don't. I mean, I saw the footage of me in the water. I'm, I'm helpless. I'm completely helpless. I'm, I'm spazzing around. These things are moving like torpedoes. Yeah. I mean, they're so fast, so athletic, so strong. Kicking one is like kicking a tree. I mean, they are solid. They're solid muscle. And they know exactly what I am. The dread of me, the dread of man has been built into them. And the lifeblood of man will be required of them. Like, it's so clear, this created order is so clear and came out so clearly to me in that water with those predators. So I, I would say that was huge on me. Like, Genesis 9 just came screaming through wow. with the sharks in the water. And everything else, just massive humility and laughter. Constant laughter. I mean, you think about little busy, busy crabs in the bottom of the ocean. They don't even know our world exists. And they don't care. They're just they're doing what they got put here to do. And yeah. they're busy at it, and they're working hard. The, cor the coral is busy cloning itself all through the Great Barrier Reef, just doing what God put it here to do. And it's, it's phenomenal. That's powerful, man. All right, well, I'm excited. Of course, we already as a church have purchased the uh, church license thing to show it to everybody. Yeah. And we're super excited about that, man. And uh, <clears throat> I think today was the last day for that. But I want you to give it's a chance. It's not. It's not the last day for the public screening license. Okay. Family, uh, family package only. Okay. But I, I would say on the public screening license, like people have tons of things they need to fundraise for. Like we, we wanted to make this available to God's people to go use it where it's needed. Yeah. So, you know, we want to recoup our money and try to go make another one. But we also, like, we want people to go use this to fundraise for adoptions. We want people to fundraise for crisis pregnancy centers. We want people to fundraise for mission trips. Like, get that public screening license, sell tickets, put 100% of the money wherever you need it. Oh, powerful. Or, you, just use it. Excellent. Wherever wherever it's needed. All right, so where can people go to watch the film? Riotandthedance.com is where you get a public screening license. That's where you can order it. Uh, but we've, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people worldwide have done this already. They're getting those group licenses. So ask your church, ask your school, your homeschool co-op, your Christian school, whatever it might be. Organize some friends, like grab a license, you know, put a showing on, put a screening on, sell tickets and put that money wherever it's needed. So riotandthedance.com is where you can grab that license. Excellent. Okay, everyone, go to riotandthedance.com, get the license, go watch the film. Let's do it. Like I said, where you're going to hear us talking soon, uh, let's make sure that we properly help to fund all these uh, productions that are done so well uh, and uh, so professionally and just bring glory to God so that we can get more and more and more. Put Let's put all of our money to these things and do what we can to support the work of uh, Andy Wilson and uh, Gordon Wilson fantastic. It'll bless you. Uh, go watch the first one right now, but also make sure you see the second one. Nate, thanks for joining us today, brother. Hey, thank you, Jeff. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, guys. We'll be right back right here on Next Week with Jeff Durbin. Stay with us. The goal for New St. Andrews College, as it trains its students, is not to make people who will be able to go out and just get jobs. People who will just be bricks in the wall of our society. The goal for New St. Andrews College is to make students into men and women who will really impact culture. All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of Next Week with Jeff Durbin. I'm Jeff Durbin, and that is Luke Pearson right there. What up? Hey, we're both recovering from the flu and stuff right yeah, now. This so is like the sick edition. This is the sick edition. They're very good. Sick. Uh, the, it's totally sick. Uh, trying our best to be a lot of wheeze laughing. Push this through, yeah, <laughs> push through this. It's not coronavirus, maybe. Yet. Um, so, I mean, it felt like maybe it was a little different. 
This one had a different flavor to it. It was more a little like, different than a normal flu. Like, like Dos Equis? I don't know. It's like more like yeah, more like a Corona flavor. It was, it was uh, you know, it was more like a cheap, flabby, you know, sort of uh, you know, headache kind of in the morning. You know, yeah, it was. It's funny because we were coming back from the airport all like, man, that trip from Wuhan was rough. Yeah. Well, and then I, two days later. Well, I could. I, well, done. I'll say. I'll I'm say, done. I'm glad you brought that up because it just shows how thoughtless I am. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we're coming back from Oklahoma. Very important trip. And I made it my mission as much as is possible when we were around large crowds of people walking yeah. together to have conversations with Pastor Luke about how long that plane ride was back from Wuhan. Um, am I saying that right? I, yeah. yeah. Potato, well, potato. They knew what I was saying because it was funny as I was saying, I was like, man, that is a long flight back from Wuhan. I'm tired. People would just like look back at me. It was, it was so much fun. It, it was, was so fun. much fun. Yeah. And I would say things as I were walking in the crowds, I'd say Wuhan and it was a long flight back and oh, I'm so tired. I would say things like, man, are you warm? <laughs> I was, are, is everyone warm? <laughs> it was, it's so much fun. I mean, to love your neighbor yeah. in that way. Just to let them enjoy. Yeah. So we're making fun of it, yeah, and then we come back and then you get... I immediately regretted that. Yeah, yeah. I had it before. The week before that. And then I kind of recovered. I'm still feeling it. Um, and then you got it last Friday. And I was like, oh, man, please don't let it be the same one. But, but it turns as it turns out, in Oklahoma, there was a bunch of people in Oklahoma... Everybody had it there. ...that said, like, oh, I have it or I'm on the tail end of it. We're like, oh, great, you just shook my hand ten times. After they, like, kissed us on the mouth. They're like, I stuff. love you so much. Your ministry means so much to me. <laughs> and they're just, like, like, putting fingers in the mouth, and, you know. <laughs> that, that didn't really happen. Well, it did twice, but it was not, you know, it wasn't weird. It wasn't weird. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is what you're going to get today on the sick edition is the Punchy Pastors. Um... You have a card there. What do you want to talk about? Um, well, <clears throat> since we just talked about um, God's created order with our dude N.D., N.D. Wilson, uh, I saw, I didn't even know this, but apparently in Arizona, they have put forth the Save Women Sports Act in Arizona, the Republicans here in Arizona. Save it's Women's a sports. bill, and so the point is they're going to assign high school students to sports leagues according to their biological sex. Nice. I was like, oh, that's great. Um, and not not by the gender uh, with which they identify. So I was like, oh, that's really good. I'm glad to, I'm glad to know we're doing something good here in Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I saw that old Sacagawea Warren said uh, that this is a cruel bill and that trans athletes are not a threat. Interesting. Yeah. Did you see the, uh, the I don't watch South Park. Me. But but the clip from South Park with her oh yeah with the with the with, uh, Macho Man Randy Macho Savage Randy oh, Savage amazing. like yeah. trying to like get into like women's competition yeah. I thought that was the, one of the, probably, probably the most devastating and brilliant oh, response genius. to transgenderism yeah. in sports that it can and it came from South Park yeah I mean you know you could preach on that for days mm. and the thing that had a massive like hey dummy. Mm. Like was South Park, Randy Savage. But what was the name of the character though? Isaac, do you know the name of the character? Heather. Was it Heather? Heather. <laughs> Heather. Is it? Are you right? Someone's gotta look that up right now. Like what was the, the name of the character? Yeah. Cause they were like, oh, they like interviewed some girl. They're like, are you excited about, you know, this new whatever? And she's like, oh, I don't care, you know, what they are or whatever. And then it was a macho man, Randy Savage. I think he was literally like ripping limbs off. Or yeah, something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like beating him up, punching yeah. him. Because, uh, because this, is a, this is a creation. There's a created order. And there's a, a creative design to everything. And so, you know, men are biologically built differently. Right. And that, that used to be something that was just, just sort of a given and understood and and uh, not something people would, you know, be upset about necessarily. I mean, it's a good thing to have a man with broad shoulders that can carry things and build things that's different than a right. woman. And, uh, and also in the sense of, like, protection of a family and all those. That's, that's actually a, a positive. It should be seen as a positive element. That's cruel. But uh, <laughs> it's just so great. But it, it's amazing, though, to, to think. Well, I mean, if you would have said, I don't know, I guess maybe if you would have said 30 years ago, hey, there's going to be a dude, yeah. Um, and there's there's going to be like full contact mixed martial arts in 30 years. Because I mean, before the before uh, UFC, uh, I was invited to fight in UFC two, I think it was, 
See, before, okay, so it was like a whole new thing. You're going to let people fight, like really fight and shin kick and like mm. elbow and knee, like competitively. That was like a whole crazy thing. And so if you would have said back then, like in the early 90s, before like 95 or whatever was the first year. It was like Kurt Angle. Yeah. <laughs> there's going to there's gonna be like legit full contact fighting, MMA. That would be, wow, seriously? Like elbows and knees? That's going to be deadly because it is deadly. Yeah. Like you can legitimately kill someone. And like even when you're choking somebody out, we talked about this recently, when you're choking somebody out, like the reason they rush in as soon as you tap is because the distance between passing out and dying can be Second. Very small seconds. Now you got to get off, get off immediately because you could die. You could cut off blood flow to the brain. So at any rate, first level to say that you'd have MMA with elbows and knees and like really choking somebody out would have been like what? Wow, that's deadly. How can wow? That's going to be crazy. But then to suggest and then guess what else? There's going to be dudes that think they're chicks that are going to fight in the women's division. People be like. They'll they'll kill him. Yeah, they're they're gonna annihilate him. So then that's what happened with that one dude, um, that uh, uh, tucked and fought the 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 chick the chick. He like he he destroyed. He broke bones. Oh, and yeah. like broke bones in her face. And it's and everyone's it's uh, yeah, yeah. Like, of course, like what? And imagine this, like because it still exists today. If you're driving down like if you're driving down the road here in ASU and you see a dude fighting a girl like if you see two dudes fighting you're going to be like you know oh no something's really wrong and like maybe you'll try to break it up but if you saw a dude beating down a girl yeah, you, 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 you still the reaction is going to be like what are you thinking are yeah. you out of your mind you're a man you can't do that to him but all of a sudden now you you sanction it and you put it into a ring and you're like well he says he's a he says he's a chick all of a sudden, people are like, well, you know, I guess. You know, it's, it's a guy beating down a girl in a yeah. ring, and everyone's, like, applauding and going, I, I, I feel like this is wrong. <laughs> I feel it's like, like watching Breaking Bad. Like you find yourself rooting for, <laughs> yeah, the, rooting for the bad guy. <laughs> the bad guy. It's like, at the end of the series, hey, you weren't supposed to be doing that. And you're not supposed to be rooting for a guy that tucks and beats down a girl. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> talk. And when I say tuck, I mean tuck. No, I know, and I'm laughing. I mean tuck his genitals. Yeah, I know, and I'm laughing because in that South Park episode, <laughs> Macho Man did not tuck, and they put a lot of detail into that part of the cartoon. <laughs> yeah, it was very no, obvious. I, I think. Well, okay, here's the thing. Like, it, in speaking about the created order, and uh, Nate's really going to love this, by the way. Yeah. Like, he's like, well, that's on the tail end of my yeah. interview. Um, what I think that there's a degree of um, yielding and cowardice that we've we've sort of succumbed to today, where we're afraid to say the hard things and the obvious things because. We've been so sort of we uh, so influenced by this weird evangelicalism that's like don't ever say the harsh thing, don't say the you just love like Jesus. It's like great, read Matthew twenty three and I'll love like Jesus. Like mm. how about that kind of love where right. he calls people a brood of vipers and whitewashed tombs and all that stuff. But like you know in scripture when pe when it's a life and death situation and it's a community destroying situation, it's a justice situation, it's a fatherlessness situation, you know, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's guns blazing. Right. I mean, it's guns blazing to the degree that like in Isaiah 1, when there's injustice that's rampant, God's, God says, I don't want your worship. Don't even want it. Like, don't, it, it's, 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 like it's, it's making God sick mm -hmm. that they're coming to him with this worship while this injustice is all around them. And uh, there, so there's that. God's like, don't even give it to me. I don't want it. And then there's the, the instances in Scripture where God has to explain to Israel so that their, her eyes are opened. Like, let me show you how far you've gone. Um, you're a whore. Yeah. Right? You're a whore. You're the prostitute. But not just. And that would be already offensive. What's up? What's up, hoe? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, in the modern vernacular, someone's saying, right. like, no, what's, the, what's, the, what's the punch you deliver today that's like the harsh word? It's like the vernacular is you're a, you're a hoe, yeah, and that's like you dirty. You can't say that about me. So then there's like whore, and those are all very like very strong ways to describe something it ought not to be. Well, in the scriptures, God calls Israel a whore, yeah, and then and then you go Ugh. like that's enough, and then God goes, but no, actually you're different Worse. than other prostitutes because they get paid for what they do. But you just sit and spread your legs to whoever will come, right? And um, and you get nothing. So that's 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 some serious, serious um, 
in modern vernacular, trash talk, hmm. right? And it's harsh, but God reserves the harsh language for the life and death situation stuff, the community destroying stuff, the injustice stuff. And I feel like we've been silenced by the left and those who are seeking to pervert society and morals and everything else to the degree that we don't say the obvious. Mm. Like we don't say the obvious, like the transgender man has to hide his, his testicles, mm. right? Like you're, you're only yeah. pretending, and I know you're uncomfortable right now because the design aspect, the feature here, um, doesn't allow for you to do that. Mm. Like what do you have to do? You have to build contraptions and use tape and whatever the case may be to, to pretend in the way that you are. And I know you're uncomfortable and it's not supposed to be that way. Or the, like I'm talking about the case of the transgender fighter going against the creative order, a man fighting a woman in that kind of context in a brutal exhibition, like you're wearing tights. Hmm. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like the MMA fights, like the, you, they're, they're wearing, you know, very tight stuff. Mm. Because you don't want the guy to be able to pull on right, anything. Right. Like they used to be in like judo and jujitsu. What and it is that way too in jujitsu. You wear your gi, yeah. and it's a whole different style. So there's like no gi and there's gi jujitsu, right? Because there's a difference. Like gi is you you can use the person's gi against them. You can choke them with their gi. You can grab their gi. So in the MMA, like the whole it's no gi, so it's slick, wet, and it's also nothing to pull on. Right. So you've got these really tight spandex things, right. and it's like, how do you think that dude fought in the women's division? He had to hide it. Yeah. Because it's a design feature. Uh, unless, of course, he did the other thing, right. which is, a knife. you know, he used, he went under the knife. Right. And I, I don't know, I guess my point is, is in terms of like when we approach, when we approach unbelieving worldviews, I think we should be more direct when it's a life and death situation and a society destroying situation, like we should, I, like I, I'll just say it. I think the South Park clip in, in really defying what they're trying to do was an amazing smackdown mm -hmm. because it just, it just highlighted, here's this, this, this huge, disgusting man yeah. with huge, bulging muscles and the be and <laughs> a beard, beard beating on a woman. <laughs> and it's like, that just needs to be highlighted. And I think we, and we should, we should be speaking the obvious. I think we're too afraid to do it. Yeah, I agree. I but, agree. It's crazy. But it, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think, I know where Arizona is trying to do this bill. I saw, I think they're doing this bill because I saw there was a group of female athletes that's like suing somebody for allowing dudes to like run in races and stuff. Right, I saw that too. Yeah. And which I thought was great. I was like, thank you. I'm glad somebody's standing up. Yeah. But the liberals are just kind of, losing their minds they don't really know how to handle this because you know they're all about women's rights and protecting women but then you have actual women saying no i don't want this this isn't helpful for us right and so they've kind of just backed themselves in this like moral dilemma yeah moral corner where they don't know what to do and so they're like a caged animal <laughs> so it's also interesting too because because uh, look at look at the fallacious claim it's it's that we love women so yeah, exactly. much. We want to empower them. We love women so much. And you, Christians, you don't love women. Conservatives, whatever that might mean today, you don't really love women. We love women. We want to give women this. We want to empower women. But you ask the question, who really loves women? Because it's the Christians who are in, in quote-unquote conservatives, which essentially would hold to a, a creator-creation distinction. God is a creator to order. Who are saying... No, that's immoral to let a man beat down a woman. Mm. Man should not be able to lay his hands on a woman. And he sh certainly shouldn't be able to be elbowing a woman to breaking her skull. Yeah. And so who's loving women more? Right. Is it really empowering to women to, to let a man tuck and fight a woman uh, just because he says he feels like a chick? Um, he's destroying her. And, and in the same sense, like to... to to lie about biology. I mean, anybody who looks at human biology and looks at the male uh, DNA, male biology versus the female, is gonna say, this is different than that. Right. This has more strength, this is, this is, this is gonna be something that's physically able to do more, and that's just the created order. It's a creator-creation distinction that you shouldn't be angry about. Mm. It's just the way things are. God made it that way. And, um, and so when you look at it that way, everyone should be able to tell and say that it's obvious. So who's loving women more? Mm. Is it, is it the Christians or is it the leftists, the liberals? Right. Because I don't want to see a woman get her face kicked in by no. a man. 
period. Not at all. Also, if, if you would have said, it's amazing, if you would have said in the 80s um, that a man, a man, will be, a man is going to dress like a woman and then beat a woman to a pulp, I think generally the consensus would, be, would have been in the 80s. That, that's disgusting. Now it's, it's like it's praised as you, you, should, you deserve a trophy for that yeah. because you're, you're amazing. And this goes back to even like the film and the purpose of N.D. Wilson's uh, work and film and, and Wilson's work with these, which I think is so amazing, is that what they're really testifying to in a beautiful way is the creator-creation distinction. Yep. We fairly recently had on um, a gentleman who talked about one-ism versus two-ism. Yes. And there's essentially two worldviews. There's a one-ist worldview and a two-ist worldview. And I, I love it. It seems pithy but simple. And it, that's really what's wrong, too, with the transgenderism. Same issue. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's really what N.D. And, uh, well, the Wilsons are doing, Gordon yeah. and, and Nate are doing with the film, is they're highlighting the creator-creation distinction, saying there's meaning and purpose and design here, there's order here, there's, um, there's, 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 a, there's a clear eye to this is supposed to be this way and it was meant to be that way. Whereas the, that's what the Christians are saying about the world, but what the transgender argument essentially does, it comes from a, 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 um, a oneist mindset and that is all is one exactly and we're all part of this one universe and i can i could be anything that i want right i could i could redefine anything because it's all one everything is one and so the whole transgenderism issue the uh homosexuality issue to whatever degree or whatever classification is essentially that two that oneist mindset all is one and i could determine for myself mm. what i am how, how I want to live, what I want to look like, um, what gender I am. And it's, it, isn't it amazing? I, I think it's just crazy. I was watching uh, fairly recently somebody talking about um, where they're at and how they classify themselves. It, it was about 60 seconds of the biggest mess I could possibly imagine. It was like this person wasn't saying they were male or female uh, or switching sexes. It, they were just basically saying it's undefined and it could fluctuate day by day. And I thought, well, that's the oneist mindset. It's all as one. Yeah. I could be anything that I want to be and redefine because there is no creator exactly. that gives to it imposes upon this creation a meaningful order of distinctions. And um, that's why I think, you know, it's interesting that the, the, the films, the ride and the dance, one and two, are very, very important because it's coming against the popular zeitgeist or spirit of the age of um, there is no purpose, right. there is no meaning, there's no order, there's no beauty, there's no truth, there's no goodness. It's whatever you want and, um, and nothing is properly defined and uh, everything's up for grabs. And films like this are not only done well, they're beautiful, but they highlight that creator-creation distinction that will, when preached enough and shown enough, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel, really obliterate the the oneist mindset ultimately because it can't survive. Right. Because like we always say, what I always say, like it's it's the Christians who are having the children. Exactly. It's the Christians who are adopting the children largely. It's the Christians who are promoting the children. It's the it, but but it's the unbelievers in their worldview where they can't. Uh, yeah. Oh, this is amazing. Um, I know I'm doing a lot of talking here, but. Feel free to jump in. Um, have you gotten the ad? I talked to a couple guys that did. Have you guys gotten the ad in your phone? Um, and it's 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 been coming up a lot lately. I don't know why I got it. Um, I'm like, what am I talking about? Or go, where am I going? Where Facebook's like, you need to see this. Um, and it's basically an ad for an organization that helps gay men, gay couples, to um, to get uh, get children Ugh. and to get children through adoption or surrogacy. And have you guys gotten those? No. Anybody in here? Just you. Just me? Okay. I wonder if anyone else has gotten those. But, but I, I, so I, I, that's weird. The, the wrong thing to do is to see that and to click on it because now you're going to keep getting it. Yeah. Because now there's, you know, the, the, we, we use the same technology when, when we do it's ads. It's the same guys from Vegas. So that's maybe. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Um, so, but anyway, so getting to the point of it is they, they can't survive in their worldview. And it's amazing because you're seeing it even in the ads. 
Like, yeah. our, our worldview is lovely. Our worldview is so amazing. Our worldview is the way it's supposed to be. Our sexuality is good. It's the way that we can be. And then you start getting ads 20, 30 years later of gay couples going, um, you can come to our organization and we'll help to find you a surrogate. So you can actually jump back into the created order to make a human being so that you can have a child to go on the next generation. So that's the point is that there's a design aspect to all this order because there's a creator creation distinction that you can talk in the 70s and 80s and all you want about, you know, we know about like in, in Dr. Brown's book, where uh, Queer Thing Happened in America, there was a real push amongst the LGBT community, right. the, the gay community, to basically get into Hollywood and to start basically getting into scripts to say you need to have a gay character, but the gay character needs to be the hero. Yeah. The gay character needs to be the loved one. The gay character needs to be the oppressed one. Now you start putting that in enough TV shows, enough commercials, enough films, all of a sudden, now you're the, the hero, norm, right? It's, and, right? So, but here's the thing, 70s and 80s, early on even then, like, like look at Teen Wolf. I just, I'll just say, go, go watch Teen Wolf and go watch the scene where Styles is, is with uh, Michael J. Fox and Michael J. Fox is going to tell him that he's got this problem where he turns into a wolf. And just look at that scene from the 80s. That's like the late 80s, mid 80s or so, where even then he was like, dude, don't, don't tell me you're, you're gay. I, I, I can't handle that right now. Like it was even then in a popular mainstream film was like, that was the, the cultural, like, that, that's okay to say. Mm. Like, d d I can't handle that right now. That was mid-80s. But enough time goes by, and now it's popular. But guess what? In the year 2020, you got to start putting ads out to go, hey, you're not going to make it to the next generation. How about you adopt some kids? Or how about we help you with surrogacy? Mm. Because your worldview doesn't work. Right. And, uh, and I think that's, a, that's, that's, that's something that we need to keep highlighting and pointing to. And I'm and I, and back to ND's film. In Gordon's film, I think the beauty of films like this and things like this that are done well is that they have the ability to go mainstream to highlight the goodness of the created order that know there's meaning in these creatures in the sea and they're beautiful and glorious and crazy. Some things are just crazy. And I don't know why you guys want to eat those things. <laughs> like st I, I, I personally think <laughs> stuff, the, I, I will eat fish and chips in Ireland. Uh, but otherwise, I think what's in the ocean is really gross to eat. A lot of it is really gross. Pastor Zach loves to eat the gross stuff. He, yeah, the grosser he, it is, the better for him. He said, he, Zach said to me once, I was like, well, what, is there anything you wouldn't eat? He's like, no. He said, honestly, he said, if somebody like took their hand and scraped it across the bottom of the ocean floor in the darkest place no one's ever been, I would love to eat that. I was like, you are a disgusting man. He, he is disgusting. And that's the result of the fall. <laughs> Because Jesus would never talk like that. <laughs> There's a reason God forbid the Israelites from being yeah, I think even, so <laughs> I think even Jesus would be like, ew. <laughs> ew. <laughs> oh, my um, goodness. But uh, um, I, so I don't, I wonder if we can even talk about this now in here. But Nate was uh, telling me when we, we went out to eat, I think, we were eating with him. Were you there when we talked about the story? It was at his parents' house. That's right. We were talking about the sharks. Yeah. I can't wait. Oh, yeah. The sharks, uh, they, the guy told him, like, no, you just have to face the sharks. Yeah. You have to keep moving you around turn your back on and them. make eye contact with the sharks. Because if you make eye contact with the sharks, they have this natural instinct to get away from you. Mm -hmm. And I think Nate was talking about the issue of, like, dominion and yeah. the image mm -hmm. of God and how these, ma these creatures that could easily destroy you in the water... Like, as long as you're making eye contact yeah. with them, they would divert mm -hmm. and get away from you. Uh, just like this, this sense of their own fear. Exactly. Like, that they go away. So it, it, the, the one was behind him at one point. He just barely turned around and... He had to kick it. And Yeah, he had to kick it. Yeah. yeah because sharks apparently know the difference between them and the image of God. Yeah. I, I guess. Yeah. You flash your foot. What's a foot? You no. see these toes? That's the image of God, baby. You don't got ten. Where's your ten? <laughs> hey, apparently it works. So. Yeah. Are we done? I think. I think so. Yeah. I think. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? No. No. Okay. So yeah, this is the sick edition of uh, next week with Jeff Durbin. Um, the riot and the dance. Water. Um, yes. Do we have a website? We're gonna flash the website. 
right now. This is a great I think thing. It's just the ride of the dance. The, doing things in post is go to this right here. The website's right here. Go to the website, get the film, tell everybody about the film because the film, I think, is is it's about the whole thing is it's it's important for us to recognize as Christians as you're producing media and, and living in this world with art and all the stuff that's going on around that's being pumped into our phones and our television sets is that we have to have an impact in this area as Christians with a Christian worldview. So it's not just about going to, to go to the Christian film, which, hey, by the way, um, I don't care. Like oftentimes, when they, we talked about this, when there's a really bad Christian film with a bad script, bad cinematography, bad acting, bad directing, people are like, hey, come to our premiere. We're like, no. No, not at all. It was funny, uh, Kenneth Gentry was talking about Dr. Bonson. Mm. Dr. Bonson is one of our heroes. Oh, yeah. We would say he's a mentor. He's taught us, even though he's with the Lord. Um, <laughs> Dr. Bonson loved secular music. Right. You, you know that. Yeah. He hated contemporary Christian yeah. music. And I think somebody had said to him once when Amy Grant was big, getting big or someone like that, like, you should really listen to this. Like, Amy Grant, he was like, uh, no. <laughs> he said, he said, uh, he said, I, I like, he said, I like my, my paganism straight up. Yeah. Or something, something like, that. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah but he was joking. But I, I think we, even, even Dr. Bonson would point out even then, like these Christian artists are not very good. No. And just because you talk about Jesus in your song, if you're not a good singer, and I'm not a good singer, so I would never try, um, or if you're not good, a good musician, like just because you're saying Jesus doesn't mean like I have to come listen right. and say, hey, that's wonderful. Like, right. great. We should be doing a good job. Absolutely. And, uh, and uh, I hate most Christian films just because it's bad storyline. It's fake. It feels fraudulent, mm. right? Um, and uh, we need to be doing better. And I think what, what the Wilsons are doing and what Right in the Dance is doing. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's beautiful. It's important. And so it's really well done. So it's not about just seeing the film. It's also about promoting the Christian worldview yep. and the creator creation distinction in the world, in the context of a world that hates God, that really needs Jesus. So let's do that together. Let's share the film and watch the film. Let's make them a boatload of money. Yes. So that they can make more part films. three, part four, yeah. and then uh, just a ton more films. Right. Yeah, it's good Amen. to. Uh, I want to make the will. The I want to make Andy and Gordon rich. Yeah. So they can keep making amazing stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's do it. All right, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. Next week, Jeff Durbin, go to endabortionnow.com to join us in our fight to bring equal justice for the preborn and to criminalize and end abortion in our nation, in our states, and cities and towns. Um, be sure to be praying for what's happening in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. SB 13, Senator Joseph Silk. Uh, go to Free the States. Check out more information on that. But go to endabortionnow.com to get your church equipped to go bring the gospel to the abortion mills and to join us in our effort to criminalize abortion in our country once and for all. Thank you guys for watching. We'll catch you next time.